I usually don't start with the dedication, but I'm going to for this one because it says, for the grandchildren I will not see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you dying? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, well, not any more than the rest of us. Time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. <laughs> um, no, it's not that so much. It's that as I thought about who I wanted this book for, certainly for Native people, contemporary Native people, I wanted to write this book for. Certainly for non-Natives who know nothing about Native history, I wanted to write this book for. But in large part, I wanted to write it for you know my grandchildren and other people's grandchildren that I won't see. I mean, uh, I'm, I'll be 70 this next year, and uh, my health is, is iffy. Um, and I know that uh, some of my grandkids, uh, I'll never see them born. And this is sort of something I wanted to leave for them that I've done. So that's pretty much it. But it's also for, you know, those generations that, that come afterwards. Uh, I wanted to write a book that was not simplistic, but a simpler approach to Native history than a lot of the history books. Or a lot of history books, very good history books, you know, uh, are very fact-based and they just, you know, sort of work you through a particular period. Then you've got to find another book to work through another period. And all these are great books and many of them I read in anticipation of writing this thing. But I wanted to write something that had, that talked about the arcs, the historical and political arcs in Native history. So, you know, what, what are those big arcs in, uh, in Native history? You know, uh, how do they form? Uh, what kind of an impact do they have on, uh, on Native people? And so it was sort of a, kind of a cook's tour, I suppose, of, of Native history. And I wanted to make it personal, too, because I lived through part of this. And uh, so it's part memoir, I guess. It's part history, a large part history. Uh, it's even, I mean, the, the strategy that I use for telling the story really is, a, you know, a, more of a fictional storytelling strategy. Uh, and in my mind, the, the good thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that the line between, his, between fiction and nonfiction is virtually non-existent. And what I'm being mean, I point people to political discourse to show that the line between fiction and nonfiction is indistinguishable. I listen to politicians talk and hear what they say, and I'm thinking, you know, is that fiction? Is that nonfiction? What is, what's going on there? So this book is, you know, sort of a combination of all those things. On that question of uh, fiction uh, versus being a novelist, right. writing a novel is buttering warm toast while writing a history is hurting porcupines with your elbows. Yeah. I have never, ever heard that uh, description before, and I, I love it. Well, it... As I was trying to think of how I was going to describe the process of writing this thing, it took me six years to write it. And there were points when I was ready to give it up, to be honest with you. Uh, it was hard. Um, I, I hate facts. I mean, I, I hate them in a sort of visceral way because they get in the way of storytelling sometimes. And so if you're writing non, if I'm writing nonfiction, I have to figure out a way to allow, you know, uh, literary flourishes to wrap themselves around facts. These are like pillars that you keep, it's like a big room with all these pillars in it and you can't move the damn pillars and you keep running into them and you gotta arrange them in some way that, uh, that makes sense, that's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, books for me, literature for me, uh, needs to be entertaining, not not in the, you know, let's turn the television set on entertaining. But when you sit down to read a book, I think as a writer, you have an obligation to provide entertainment for the reader to where they can pick up the book and say, wow, you know, I don't know if I agree with that, but it was a good read. You know, I enjoyed that. You know, I, I didn't feel as though I wasted my time on that book. Now, some people argue with me and say, no, no, entertainment, you shouldn't have entertainment in the book. It should be just the truth and nothing but the truth, but God Almighty, the truth is such a slippery thing. You know, grease a pig and set it loose in a field, uh, that's, that's the truth. So I, I try to be, I try to make even the, the most serious matters somewhat entertaining so that uh, you don't feel as though I'm hitting you over the head with a sledgehammer. I learned a long time ago when I was 
doing sort of frontline activism, that yelling at people didn't get you very far. Lecturing them didn't get you very far. Telling them the truth as you understood it and expecting them to agree with you many times was a waste of time. And so what you had to do is you had to come at it uh, from an angle. Uh, tell the truth, but tell it slant, I think Emily Dickinson uh, suggested. And so humor lets you get past a person's defenses. You sort of get you know, in nice and cuddle up closely with them before you, you know, sort of slip a little knife in. Uh, I mean, not, I don't mean that in a mean way. It's just that uh, if someone throws up you know, a defense against what you're saying, you know, it, you just run right into it. The book runs right into that wall and that's it. That's the end of it. So I think you, as a writer, at least for me, I'm under an obligation to, uh, to, to, to tell the truth, tell it slant, uh, but also make it entertaining in a good way, in, a, in, in the best sense of entertainment. The book is The Inconvenient Indian, A Curious Account of Native People in North America. I've been speaking with the author Thomas King and The Inconvenient Indian, published by Doubleday Canada.